Hello, friends. Cooper Kevin here, author of the Caverns and Creatures series of comedy, fantasy novels, and short stories. With me is, wait a minute, you're not Sam West. No. Hi. Uh, most of you probably know me from the comments as Prince Phantom. You know, yeah, uh, I was, uh, was going to, I, I just paused and froze like a deer in headlights. How the hell does this guy want to be introduced? Uh, but yeah, <laughs> actual yourself. name. Actual name Cameron. You can that if Prince Phantom is too long to call in the comments. Cameron is fine. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've been writing a couple articles uh, and uh, have uh, something a little bit special for the channel today. So, um, yeah, you're gonna just give us a, a little bit of what we're gonna do today. Well, I couldn't help but notice in uh, a video that you all, uh, you and Sam did about the spell Armor of Agathus, that uh, you weren't as high on it as I personally am, which is fine. Your opinion is yours. But I do love to prove people wrong. And so that's what we're here to, here to do today. Hey, uh, we a have challenge. A, yes, we have a build specifically centered around the spell. Now, I will be the first to tell you that building a character around the spell armor of Agathus is not a idea that is unique to me i'm not the first person to come up with this i'm not even the first person to come up with the little combination of rules that i'm going to be talking about here today but what i am going to try and be doing is making a character that is viable levels 1 to 20 is fun to play at all of those levels this isn't a build that doesn't come online until level 14 or something this is something that you can actually play in your game, have fun, and be a very unique character that really I don't think any other type of build in D&D can really support as well as this game. Now, I have read your build, um, and it, is, uh, it will be linked in the, in the description of this video. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed. I think you succeeded in your, in your charge. Um, however, you will... You said you're a big, you're a fan of. Is that outside of this build or just generally? So okay, well let's talk about Armor of Agathus and let's yeah. talk about what it actually is. To uh, to refresh, uh, Armor of Agathus is a first level spell, normally only available to warlocks. We have a little bit of war a bit of a workaround that we might be able to use for that, depending on your game. But normally only available to warlocks. It's one action casting time, lasts for one hour, uh, and it creates a frost-like armor on top of whatever you're currently wearing that provides you five temporary hit points per spell level and if you are hit by a melee attack while you have these temporary hit points the creature that hit you takes five cold damage and that five both on the temporary hit points and on the cold damage scales up whenever you uh, upcast the spell so for second level you get two temporary hit points two, two, uh, excuse me ten Temporary hit points, ten cold damage, and so on and so forth. Now, the reason Sam and I weren't super impressed with this is it feels like on a you know, five temporary hit points, big deal. Somebody might hit you and take five damage while you, and then you know the spell's gone. But more more likely is you're going to get hit with an arrow or something. You're going to lose your hit points, and nobody's going to take any damage, or or a spell or whatever. Well, that's a very good observation in the fact that it does not trigger the temp the cold damage if you get hit by a ranged attack or something like a fireball or something. Right, but so, you still lose the points. And we, and we do still lose the temporary points, so we're going to have countermeasures for that. Yes. And I should also mention that as a general rule in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, there are not nearly as many creatures with ranged attacks as you think there are. Not you okay. specifically, but the general consensus <laughs> of... Uh, the player base. The majority of monsters simply do not have ranged attacks. And those that do would much prefer to use their melee attacks than their regular, than their ranged attacks. Uh, take, for example, uh, a bandit captain has a multi attack if they attack in melee. But if they have to resort to their ranged attack, which is a crossbow, they only get one attack. So if we're forcing enemies to make ranged attacks on us, that's a win. Most of the time. There are some exceptions, of course, but the vast majority of the time, creatures would prefer to be in melee than ranged. But we are still going to have counter. Even the bandit captain, though, you know, unless 
until you're getting up close and personal, you know, he's going to use his crossbow from a distance. If he's smart, he will. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get into what exactly we're doing here because we can talk about the spell all day, but until I actually get into the specifics of the build, I'm not going to be changing your mind. Right, right. So, so what do we start with? Race? Yes, let's start with race. So this is the first thing that may pose a problem. But if it does, don't worry, I have a workaround. We're going to be taking the Mark of Warding Dwarf. Now, some of you are already saying, what the heck is that? Well, in the Eberron campaign setting, there are marked uh, dragon marks. Uh, in fact, there are dragon marked houses. It's kind of like a nobility system. Now, don't quote me, I'm not super up to date on my Eberron lore. But the dragon marks impose different magical effects to those who have them. If we choose to play a mark of warding dwarf, then we get a couple of neat abilities. Um, for example, we get, uh, if your table does not use custom ability score improvements, which I know some do, most do, but some don't, it gives us a plus two to con and a plus one to intelligence, which is exactly what we want. And it gives us a couple of free abjuration spells per day. That's useful for us. But the biggest thing it gives us is access to the Armor of Agatha's spell on whatever spell list we want. It's automatically added to us. As long as we are a spellcaster, it is part of our spell list. We do not get it automatically, but it is one of the spells that we can either prepare if we're a prepared caster or choose if we are a learned spellcaster. That's going to be important for this build. Yes. <laughs> if that is not part of your campaign. If your DM does not allow dragon marked races, which is understandable, they're slightly more powerful than other races, but really not that much more. You trade off most of your race's actual abilities for some extra spells. So they're good on certain builds, like this one, but not all of them. But if, you're, but if your DM does not allow this, instead I would recommend the Earth Genasi. So the Earth Genasi doesn't give us Armor of Agathis, but it does give us a couple of other great things. Um, specifically, we're talking about the Earth Genasi from Monsters of the Multiverse, the new book that was just released that had updated races. Uh, that's very important. The old Earth Genasi kind of sucks. So Earth Genasi gets us uh, Blade Ward as a bonus action. Now, Blade Ward is a spell that you and Sam have hated on. Yes, we have. And with good reason. If you take it and you don't build around it, if you don't have a build that supports it, it is a horrible spell. But it does have some uses. And this, this build is going to be one that uses it very frequently, in fact. Earth Genasi makes it even better because we can cast it as a bonus action, which means we can do other things with our action. So Earth Genasi is a great choice. We also get Pass Without Trace, which is arguably the, second, the best second level spell in the entire game. Uh, surprise rules are busted, and they definitely need a revision in the next edition of D&D. Oh, we're going to have to so, talk about that in, at length so, at some point. Yes, I highly recommend uh, you deep dive into the surprise rules. Basically, if you get surprise on an encounter, you're probably winning it. That's the short of it. But for starting stats, uh, I'm assuming point by here, because if you're rolling stats, I cannot determine what you're rolling. Oh, before we get into that, we're still on races yeah, yeah. here. Um, yeah. You know, we we picked the Earth Genasi. Where did we get the uh, armor of Agathus from? Well, we're getting there. Oh, okay. But I idea. have to give you the starting stats first because we're doing a little bit of multiclassing, and multiclassing requires stats. Okay. So if you took the Mark of Warding Dwarf, our stats are very simple. We take an 8 strength, 13 dexterity, 15 constitution, 15 intelligence, 12 wisdom, and 8 charisma. We'll put a plus one to dex and a plus two to int for our racial bonuses. If your DM does not allow you to change that, then just swap the uh, 13 dex for a uh, 13 constitution and 15 dex then. Very simple. Either way, we're, want we're wanting to end up with a couple of odd numbers that we're going to round up with feats later. If you had to take Dareth Genasi, well, we're going to have to multi-class from Warlock. So we need a 13 in Charisma. So that's an 8 strength, 13 dexterity, 14 uh, constitution, 15 intelligence, 8 wisdom, which hurts a little bit, and a 13 charisma. So 
the big downside with having to oh and i should mention taking a plus one to dex and a plus two to intelligence for a 14 and 17 respectively so the big downside with having to go earth genasi is we do have to multi-class into warlock and multi-classing into warlock requires a 13 in charisma that eats away at our other stats the biggest drawback to it is that we are going to be very 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 bad at wisdom saves mm. um which I have preached in your comments many times is a deadly thing. So we may want to take some time later on in our character's life to shore up those saves. We'll talk about how we can do that later. All right, now, before we move on, you know, you've got your, your Mars Dwarf and your Earth Genasi. Now, if you, if you had to, could you do this with, like, a, a human? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, in fact, variant human getting a feat at level one is an incredibly viable pick for this. Same with custom lineage. Um, both of those work very well. It allows us to basically increase our feat progression. So I'll talk about the feat that we're taking at level four. If you took variant human, just take that at level one right. and just take the feat that I tell you to take at level eight and just, you know, just push all those forward. It's actually so, very so, good to do that. So that is a viable option. So uh, recap really quick. Uh, what is the advantage of the Earth Genasi that we're looking at? So the, the big advantage of the Earth Genasi is access to Blade Wars as a cantrip <laughs> awesome. and Pass Without Trace added to the wizard spell list for us. Okay. So those are the two big advantages. You can play this with any race, really. I'm just giving you what I feel are the two most optimal picks. That's all. Okay, that's fine. The race is not super integral to the build, but if you can get the Mark of Warding Dwarf, it makes the build a lot better. So let's go on to level one, and this is the only level where our race selection is going to make a difference. Because our Mark Dwarf, well, they don't need to go into Warlock. Our Earth Genasi, however, does. Yes. So for the Mark Dwarf, for level one, we will be taking Artificer 1. Now, those of you who are familiar with wizard optimization in 5th edition will know that taking one level of Artificer and then going 19 levels of wizard is generally the agreed upon strongest way to make a wizard. And why is that? Because the starting proficiencies for, arm, for the Artificer are much better than the wizard starting proficiencies. Uh, artificers get constitution saving throw proficiency and we desperately need that right we are going to be concentrating on spells that is going to be a key factor of our character and dropping concentration on those spells is going to be bad for us so we get constitution saving throw proficiency we get medium armor and shield proficiency which is a massive increase over just taking mage armor for example sure mage armor with our stats would give us a 15 ac and if we're a mark dwarf we can actually cast mage armor once a day for free but half plate and a shield gets us a 19 AC. That is a plus four. Yeah, so uh, certainly better. Yes. The other big in advantage of Artificer is obviously we're going, I've already mentioned that we're going into Wizard. Both Artificers and Wizards both key off intelligence. So we don't have to worry about any multiclassing requirements. And the Artificer, actually, unlike the Paladin and the Ranger, when multiclassing, rounds up when adding their spell their spells uh, to the multiclass. So, for example, if you take five levels of Wizard and one level of Paladin, you have the spellcasting ability of a fifth-level character. But if you take five levels of Wizard and one level of Artificer, you have the spellcasting ability of a sixth-level character. Okay, that's fun. So the only, literally the only thing we lose by taking this dip is a slight slowdown in the speed at which we gain leveled spells. So for right. example, we gain third leveled spells at sixth level instead of fifth level. Right. But we're actually going to still gain spell slots of third level, even when we don't have any third level spells. And just so happens, Armor of Agathus is the perfect spell to upcast. So we're really not hurting by doing that. Yeah, especially so, when the build is centered around it. Yes. 
So if you had to take the Earth of Genasi, I instead recommend taking one level of Hexblade Warlock. Okay. Now, we take well, Hexblade we need, we over the Warlock other. Warlock because we need yeah. the spell. So why Hexblade in particular? Because it gives us medium armor and shield proficiency. <laughs> That's a good reason. Yep. We won't be taking too much uh, use out of Hexblade's curse. Mm. You can put it on something, but it really doesn't synergize with anything in this build. Um, so I would really just, we're really just taking it for the medium armor and shield proficiency. And that is enough, to be clear. That is enough I, of a reason. That doesn't give us the uh, constitution proficiency, huh? It does not, so, which means we're going to have to yeah. fix that later. And we'll talk about that. So, let's go ahead into our wizard levels now. So, to speed things up a little bit, I'm going to compartmentalize. We're going to go talk about levels 2 to level 6. So, and keep in mind, I'm talking about general character level. So, when we take level 2, we're an artificer 1, wizard 1. Right. So, we'll go ahead and jump up to wizard level 2, where we'll be taking the abjuration school. Now, Abjuration gives us a couple things. It gives us Abjuration Savant, which lets us copy down Abjuration spells more easily. Don't really care about that. What we do care about is the Arcane Ward. So Arcane Ward is a fun little ability. Um, I'll read it to you here so we understand, because it is the main thrust of our build. This is what makes this build work. Yeah. So starting at second level, you can weave magic around yourself for protection. When you cast an Abjuration spell at first level of higher, like Armor of Agathus, you can simultaneously use a strand of the spell's magic to create a ward on yourself that lasts until you finish a long rest. This ward has hit points equal to twice your wizard level plus your intelligence modifier. Whenever you take damage, the ward takes the damage instead. If this damage reduces the ward to zero hit points, you take any remaining damage, kind of like a polymorph. All right. So while the ward has zero hit points, it can't absorb damage but its magic remains. Whenever you cast an Abjuration spell first level or higher, the ward regains a number of hit points equal to twice the level of the spell. So if you cast a first level Abjuration spell, it gain, regains two hit points, so on and so forth. So... So uh, let me make a... Uh, yes, go ahead. Be clear about this. Uh, what is it called? Defense ward? No. That was Arcane it. ward. Arcane ward. Um, these are not hit points. I mean, these are not your hit points, right? Correct. These, are not temporary hit points. Correct. These That's the important part. Its own things, hit points. Like a, yes. You, like it's like a little force field around you. Yes. But it's it, it is best to think of it as a own. literal. Yes. It is best to think of it as a literal bubble around you right. that is protecting you from damage. Okay. So let's reread Armor of Agathus just real quick. So Arcane Ward triggers whenever we take damage. It protects us from that damage. Armor of Agathus says that whenever we are hit, not when we take damage. Okay. If it said whenever we take damage, the ward is taking the damage, not us, so it wouldn't trigger. Yeah, the, but, yeah and the, uh, the ward has language in there about uh, you're hit, but the ward takes the damage. Yeah. Right. But we are hit. So Armor of Agathus triggers. And the best part is the ward takes the damage before us and before the temporary hit points from our armor of Agathus. So, for example, say you had 10 ward hit points and 10 armor of Agathus hit points, and we'll say 10 actual HP. You'd have more than that, but just for sure. the sake of it. Right. So, say you are hit by an attack that does 5 damage. The ward takes 5 damage. You then hit crack back for 10 cold damage. Wait, why 10? Because we cast it at second level. We have 10 armor of Agatha's uh, yeah, temp that, temporary hit points. Doesn't it only hit back as many damage as it, as it takes? Like, if they hit nope. the five? Oh, no. Nope. So, when it, if a creature hits you with a melee attack while you have these hit points, the creature takes five cold damage. Oh, right. The temporary okay. hit points... And the cold damage increased by five for each slot. Okay, nice. It's a flat number. Okay, so like they hit it. us for five damage. The ward takes five damage. Our temporary hit points are safe. They have not been touched, but mm -hmm. they still take 10 damage. They hit us again for five. Now they've taken 20 damage, and we still have our full armor of Agathus. Yeah. They hit us for another five. They still take 10. 
but now we've lost our our uh, we've lost five of our, our temporary five of them yes. yes so they hit us again they have taken 40 damage before they have even touched our hp yeah that's fantastic and we're not done yet no so at this level we can also combine that with blade ward now we have resistance to the damage which means that five that they did is reduced to two they're just they're going to die before they even scratch us. So, I know what you're thinking, but Blade Ward costs an action. How are we then incentivizing creatures to actually hit us? Well, that's where our concentration comes in. We're going to be concentrating on stronger and stronger spells as we level up. To the point where our enemies can't ignore us. Right. They have to do something about it. Now, I should mention... Even if the ward takes damage for us, we still have to make uh, concentration checks. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I guess that makes sense, yeah. So, we do still need to invest in our constitution saving throws. That's why at level 5, character level 5, wizard level 4, we're taking Warcaster. Mm -hmm. This gives us advantage on those checks. So that's very important for us. That'll help us a lot. Now, other spells that help us, because let's talk about them real quick, run through them. Absorb elements is a big deal for us. That gives us resistance to an elemental type of damage like fire or, or cold. Um, that helps us sustain the ward and our temporary hit points for longer. Likely that that attack that hits you probably isn't actually going to trigger the retaliatory damage, because it's probably like a fireball or something. Mm-hmm. But it keeps our ward and our armor of Agathus up for longer, so that when we are hit, it will trigger. So absorb elements, very important. Also, the shield spell. Now, yeah. the kind of the goal of this character is to be hit. So you might say, okay, well, why did we take the levels in Artificer and Warlock for armor proficiency, and now why are we also taking the shield spell? Well, we don't want to be hit all the time. Right. I mean, that... We... This is good if you are hit, but ideally, like you, you just basically touched on the, the concentration spells, but if you've got like some kind of one of these Tasha's summoning spells going, mm-hmm. and uh, you, you've got demons you know, beating on your enemies for you, yeah. Smacking people around with your armor or Agathus uh, reaction or uh, yeah, damage is fun. So it's not an it's a lot of hp before they get to you but it's not an infinite number right right um this is shield is great if you know you're going to be hit by a lot of attacks in one turn if you've got three things swarming you all with three attacks each that's not good no matter who you are we're going to cast shield in that scenario some of them are still going to hit us even over the shield and they'll take damage that's great it's a win-win either way but it reduces the total number of things that hit us. We won't be casting uh, shield as much as an usual wizard, but we will still be casting it. Yeah, the the whole win win is the uh, the meat of this build. Yes, yeah. No matter what our enemies do, they're suffering. That's the point of this build, right? So, um, other standout spells to concentrate on in these early levels: uh, hideous laughter is great. Web is a wonderful spell because you can cast the web, stand right on the edge of it. Dare enemies to hit you to get out of the web, and they're just wailing on death. Yeah. So web is great. Sleet storm has the same effect as web, just in a bigger area and a little bit easier to get out of. Um, and for third level spells, hypnotic pattern and fear are just the control spells that completely just shut down encounters. So we're still a wizard. We're still going to be casting those. All right. So, we already talked about getting Warcaster, and that's very important for the build. Jumping up to level 7 through 9, we'll stick with Wizard for the rest of the build. So I'm not even going to talk about that. We're sticking with Wizard. Fourth level spells gives us Fire Shield. Fire Shield is a somewhat slept on spell. It lets us either choose a Fire or Cold Shield that does retaliatory damage whenever we are hit. Ah, what does that sound like? Uh, It's 2d8. It's 2d8 damage uh, of fire or cold. 
Um, and it also gives us resistance to the chosen damage types. This is great if we're going into an area or a fight where we know that we're going to be taking that type of damage. I wouldn't necessarily cast it in all encounters, but if you know you're going to be taking that type of damage, it's wonderful. And it's normally pretty easy to tell when fire and cold damage are coming. Right, but if, if something is dealing fire damage, we're and and they hit us with a and we're having a fire shield that does fire damage back at them. Aren't they probably resistant or immune to the fire damage that we're probably, yeah. but we're having resistance to the damage. That's what we want yeah, anyway. Yeah. It's and fine. It, it's it it's it really is fine either way. Okay. So um I should mention though fire shield only has a duration of ten minutes. Meaning it's probably best if we can cast it before combat breaks out. It's not really a spell that I would waste time on casting after initiative has already been rolled. All right. So if you can tell that combat is about to happen, Fire Shield is a great choice to buff yourself. It also doesn't require concentration. Ooh, that's nice. So we can combine it with our other control spells, which is great. Um, we now have access to even better control spells. We got Wall of Fire, Banishment, Summon Greater Demon. All fantastic choices that really make our enemies hate themselves. And uh, at uh, character level 9, wizard level 8, we will take another feat, Eldritch Adept for Armor of Shadows. So, this is my favorite part of the build. Yes. So you guys recently covered Armor of Shadows uh, in your Warlock Wednesdays, which I've thoroughly been enjoying. Okay. And Thank you... you you did actually note in that, and I was very proud of you for this, you noted in that that it combined very well with the Abjuration Wizard. Uh, I believe Sam noted this. Yeah, so, so, Armor of Shadows allows us to cast Mage Armor at will. Our Mage Armor is an Abjuration spell. Mm -hmm. So for every casting of Mage Armor, we get two hit points for our ward. This allows us to basically fully recharge our ward in a minute or so. Now, here's what I love about this. You've got your, uh, what is it, medium armor proficiency, your wearing armor, you, you're probably carrying a shield. Mage armor is not doing anything for you. Nope, right? nope, not yeah. at all. <laughs> you're doing this strictly to recharge your ward. Yep, uh, mage armor does literally nothing for us mechanically <laughs> besides recharge our ward. Now, I should mention, if you are the type of table that only really has one encounter per day, you don't need this. Uh, I know that that is kind of becoming the recurring theme of a lot of D&D tables nowadays. If you're only running one encounter per day, you don't need this. But if you're running more than one, this is great for you. Um, if you aren't running more than one, I just go ahead and bump your intelligence at this level, and that'll be fine as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I really like this part of the build. Yeah, this is the how, what's the duration on a, a mage armor? It's like eight hours or something. It's eight hours, yeah. But you can recast it over and over again. You don't have to wait the eight hours to recast it. it. Yeah, that's that's why because I, I think when they when they created armor of shadows, they thought ah, we'll just give it to them at will. That's a what are they really gaining there? Uh -huh. That's not too exactly. Powerful. So that is a wonderful little combination. Again, not unique to me. The internet found out about that years ago. But it's a wonderful little thing that we can do and really increases our durability. I mean, who needs healing spells when you can just recharge this pool of hit points after every fight in a couple of minutes at most? Yeah. Healing really does suck in this game. <laughs> so moving on. Uh, levels 10 through 13. Um, we now do get a subclass ability that makes us really good at counterspell and dispel magic. Um, it's called Improved Abjuration. Um, it tells us that whenever we make an abjurate, cast an abjuration spell that requires us to make an ability check, as in counterspell or dispel magic, I think those are really the only two spells. I don't know why they didn't just say counterspell and dispel magic. <laughs> um, we can add our proficiency bonus to the ability check. Normally you can't do this. Normally it's a straight intelligence check, meaning... At most, it's a d20 plus 5. That's really not that reliable. For us, at level 10, that's a d, that is a d20 plus 9, which is much better. Sure. So, and that is also great because people can dispel 
our armor of Agathus. Uh, I don't think that's going to be something that happens a lot, but if you're, the opposing side has a wizard and they notice that their melee partner is having a lot of trouble, yeah, they may be thinking to dispel that, and we can then counterspell it. They can all, we can also counterspell any attempts to disrupt our general strategy. It also even helps us if a fireball is coming at us. We can counterspell the fireball and save more of our HP. It's along a, with the rest of everybody the, else's you know. HP. Thematically fits it's uh you're maintaining uh this orb globe of protection around yourself. Uh yeah. Yep, it works great for us, uh all around. So moving on to levels ten through thirteen, uh we have this new ability. We also have possibly my favorite idea of the build. It's not necessarily optimal, but it is funny. And that's just the best part of DMD. Sure. So, Wall of Force is a heck of a spell. It creates a basically indestructible to 99% of the of printed monsters. It is indestructible. Mm-hmm. That tr- we can create it as an actual wall or we can create it as a bubble. Okay, I remember where you're going with this. Yes. <laughs> Now, the normal use of creating it as a bubble is to trap something inside of it and to basically set it aside for later. Divide and conquer. It's a very effective strategy. But what if we trapped something in the bubble with us? Yeah. Now they only have one target. And the only way out of the bubble is to hit us. And hitting us hurts. Yeah. We're casting Armor of Agathus with a fifth level slot now. That's, that is, uh, that is 25, 25 damage per hit. It's wonderful. It's great. People will die just by touching us. I love it. Sure. Now, that, uh, what level are we at now? So we're talking about levels 10 through 13. Uh, for spell levels now, we're getting up into sixth level spells. So I'm I'm just trying to think of what kind of attacks we'll be taking, or um, yeah, you know, we've got we've got our ward up. How how big is our ward? So at this level, let me double check here. So our ward is twice our wizard level. So we'll just say we're level ten right now. Right. So that's level nine wizards. That's eighteen plus our intelligence modifier, which right now is a plus three. Okay. So that's twenty one for our ward HP. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this whole wall of force thing is fun. So you've got like a multi-attacking creature that's doing more than this amount of damage each hit. Yeah, but we're casting Blade Lord. Oh, that's true, yeah. So, and the other interesting thing, at this specific level of play, you will find that the majority of monsters don't increase their damage by increasing their, their damage. They increase their damage by increasing their number of attacks. Oh, and that really hurts them. Yes, it does. <laughs> when you get into higher levels, you will start to notice big chunks of damage from singular monster attacks. Really, right now, though, unless you're fighting something like a giant or a chasmy demon, you're really not going to be taking a ton of damage from one attack. All right, so the next big thing that we get at this tier of play is the contingency spell. Now, we've had a bit of a problem up to this point about actually having Armor of Agathus up during combat. It takes an action to cast, which when we want to be concentrating on a big spell for the majority of the combat, it's a little rough, because the best time to cast that big control spell is right on turn one. Mm -hmm. Which means that we've mostly up to this point been trying to predict when we're going to need Armor of Agathus and casting it before combat begins. A lot of times that's possible, not always. Right. Generally, if it doesn't happen, I would tell you that unless it's a fight where Armor of Agnes is going to be very clearly very useful, maybe just skip out on casting it. Maybe instead just cast Hypnotic Pattern or cast Fear. And that'll probably be enough for that encounter. But yeah, now... you got like six goblins, then uh, you might not need this. Yeah, but if you have 
five bone devils, for example, that right. all only have melee attacks and do three of them. That's a pretty good time to use Armor of Agathus. And Absolutely. that is an actual encounter that we could be seeing at this level. Yeah. So, let's talk about Contingency. Because it is one of my favorite spells. Oh, it's one of mine too. So, Contingency allows us to pre-cast a spell that only targets ourselves. Armor of Agathus falls into that. Sure. So, we can set the conditions for it triggering to be literally whatever we want now what i would recommend if your dm allows it is to set the trigger for the armor of Agathus to be cast whenever we think it should be cast Wait, that's the condition it can be okay <laughs> based on the rules if your dm thinks that's a little bit too nebulous set it to whenever we take more than five points of damage okay that seems good to me because that eliminates your barbarian buddy from punching you on the shoulder as a joke, your DM telling you it deals one damage, and your armor coming out and shredding your barbarian buddy for 30 points of damage. So we have to be a little bit careful, but five points of damage is normally, at this level at least, constituting an actual attack coming at us that we're actually concerned about. Okay, well... Maybe even specify from an attack, because you know, if you fall in a pit trap, you know, you don't want the... That's good as well. You yourself. can you can specify it as five damage from an attack. Right. You can even specify it as five damage from a melee attack. Yeah, that that's probably even better. Contingency is a wonderful spell because it is this flexible. Right. You can do whatever you want with it. You can set it for whatever you want. So... It allows us to basically have Armor of Agathus up every combat that we want. It also allows us to pre-cast it the day before we go out and start doing battle with orcs or whatever so that we can actually have our full spell slot list for mm -hmm. the combats that day. Because right now we've been using Armor of Agathus at our highest level slot. Which, to be fair, most of the time is worth it. But it does well, still kind of yeah, suck. It kind of sucks. But it is worth it. Oh, it sucks that we have to use the uh, the highest level. It sucks that we have to use our highest level right. spell slot, yes. Okay, I thought you were when we could be casting saying, things like Disintegrate. Armor of Agathus you know. kind of sucks, but all right. No, 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 gotcha. no. It's not as flashy as spells of its level, but oh, it no. is a workhorse. But, I mean, that's what the build is centered on. That's, uh, yes. This is what we're doing today. Yes. So, instead, this allows us to, since Contingency has a 10-day duration we can cast it on tuesday and if we don't get attacked until friday well boom we've got it yeah it's also very helpful because as you get into these higher levels of play monsters tend to become more intelligent not always but generally speaking sure really smart monsters might even recognize the spell is it visible? depending on no, it is very visible. It creates frost on your okay. armor. Yeah. So you could potentially get around this with a disguise self spell, but it's a bit nebulous. Would the armor then appear on top of the arm of the disguise self? I would say it doesn't. But now we're using two spell slots. You know, it it's this, a little messy. I don't know. This isn't something I'm super concerned with. <laughs> well, at low levels we shouldn't be. At higher levels, when you might be fighting something like a wizard, mm -hmm. who might shout to all of his friends, hey, he has armor of Agathus on, don't hit him. Or well, hit I mean, him with ranged attacks. Yeah, that's... But then you're talking about the difference between... Yeah, they're going to find out pretty soon. As soon yes. as one guy hits you and takes a blast of cold damage, then, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no disguising that. Yeah, you're right. But it does at least get us one. Yeah. So, it's, and again, this is nebulous. This is a small... We're casting contingency anyway. We don't really care about this point one way or another. It's just an added benefit. Sure. So, it allows us to surprise people with our armor yeah. of Agathus. No, this is a fantastic use for contingency. Yeah. So, it does just an extra little bit. 
It's not really that important to the build. Whether or not your DM even rules that Armor of Agus is invisible, in my opinion, it pretty clearly is. But depending on if your DM rules that magic is widely known in that your campaign setting, which is, I have no idea if it is or isn't. That's very nebulous. So if you're in a high magic campaign where all spells are known by mm-hmm. those who should know them, this might be useful. That's all I'm saying. All right. Uh, all right, what do we got next? So at this uh, 13th level, 13th character level, 12th level wizard, I recommend you take the feat telekinetic. So, so far up to this point, we haven't really had too much to do with our bonus action. There are some spells that can supplement this, but mostly our bonus action has been pretty free. Telekinetic gives us a bonus action that we can use on each of our turns that can be used to push enemies into our control spells, remove allies from grapples or restraints, even give allies a free disengage, um, and even allow, allow us to have a free disengage if we get hit a lot and run out of our ward and our temporary hit points, which is something that can and will happen. We're not invincible. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It just takes a lot. A lot happens sometimes. Um, but this yeah, the telekinetic, it's not specific to this build. That's just if you don't have a lot to do with your bonus action, this is good practice across it is. the board. It is. Yeah. Uh, it also gives us an increase to our intelligence modifier. And if you'll notice, we intentionally set our intelligence modifier to an odd number back at character creation, 17. So this bumps us up to an 18. Sure. So very useful. And if you took the Earth Genasi and didn't need um, didn't need one of the... Oh, excuse me, not, not if you took the Earth Genasi. If you're in a campaign where you don't feel like you t- to have more than one encounter normally and you didn't take Elder to Depth and instead bumped your intelligence, well, now you're going from a 19 to a 20. So yeah. even better in that case. But telekinetic, generically good for everyone who doesn't have a bonus action to use. Very good for us because we have spells like Wall of Fire, for example, that we can push people into and double up on the damage of it. There's a yeah, bunch of little have... niche use cases for telekinetic that come up, especially if you play with those types of spells. And we have those spells. And not a lot of uses for our bonus action, so yep. wonderful. It all works wonderfully together. So not a whole lot to say about that. We'll move on to levels 14 through 17. Now, at this level, a lot of you are probably already thinking, if you've played at this level, that is, uh, monsters don't always have a ton of physical attacks at this level. We're starting to face a wide variety of enemies, spellcasters, ranged attacks, uh, People who can make make all sorts of crazy things happen. Well, this is what um, I brought up a couple of levels ago. Uh, you know, if the monsters are getting stronger. How viable is this? Now it's coming into play. So now it is coming into play. We're in higher tiers of play, and combats are getting more complicated. The orc isn't hitting us twice with his club anymore. Yeah. Uh, the pit fiend is throwing a fireball at us and then making two more attacks. It's it's a lot different. Sure. Now, you might be saying, "Oh no, our strategy doesn't work anymore. What are we? What is? What is a seventeenth level wizard to do? <laughs> what? Uh, oh, oh no! Oh no! How we haven't prepared for this? No, we're a seventeenth level wizard. We just do our wizard thing. Right. You're the strongest class in the game, especially at higher tiers. This is where we excel. This is where we." start to learn 8th, ninth level spells and basically can just delete encounters if we want to. Yeah, this is, I feel like this is a build to get us here. It can be seen as that, yes. There will be some encounters where Armor of Agatha's strategy is still great. Sure. Not all of them, and less of them now. But still some, and we'll still use it then. But on all those encounters where we're not really taking a lot of melee attacks, we're still a high-level wizard. We're fine. Yeah. So, um, next up, at uh, character level 17, wizard level 16, I would recommend taking Resilient Wisdom. Now, honestly, I wish I could have fit this on the build sooner. And this is something that you may want to play a variant human or custom lineage, just so you can get this sooner. 
Um, we wizards normally get wisdom saving throw proficiency. We didn't start as a wizard, so right. we don't get that. So, assuming we started as an artificer, which I should mention, if you started as a hexblade warlock, you did get wisdom saving throw proficiency. All right, so there's something there. Yes, in that case, I would probably take this for resilient constitution instead to buff okay. our constitu uh, our concentration checks. But the big thing that you're going to notice at these higher levels is wisdom saves happen a lot. They're very dangerous when they do happen. They can knock you out of out of combat entirely. It's you could be hit. Your entire party could be hit by a sixth level hold person. Mm -hmm. And if all of you fail, that's probably a TPK. Yeah. Um. So it is very important to invest in our wisdom saves. And I hate that we had to wait so long to do it. Yeah, this does feel like a long time. It is. We're in higher levels. A lot of times you may not even reach this. And it, I will tell you, if you find that you are failing wisdom saving throws a lot at level six, take this earlier. Yeah, do you It's mean, fine. If that you... is a weakness, if that is a weakness, this our feat selection in terms of the list is very flexible. Yeah, I was thinking this might be can, better than to take earlier than tele, telekinetic. I mean, telekinetic is fun, be. but... It yeah. might be. I took telekinetic early to increase our intelligence modifier. Ah, uh, that's true. To get us up higher. That's the reason I took that. And you'll notice, if you took the Mark of Warding Dwarf, we have, we're still at an 18 intelligence. We're not even at a 20 yet. That doesn't really hurt the build at all. You'll find that in practical application, the difference between an 18 intelligence and a 20 intelligence... It's very small. It's the mm -hmm. difference between one on our save DC and spell attack rolls. We're not making any spell attack rolls, so we don't care about that. It's one less spell that we can prepare each day out of our spell book. It's that's really about it. Yeah. So only having an 18 intelligence, it's not the end of the world for us. Mathematically, we really don't care. But of course, we took the Earth, but now see you're at a 20 now, which is great. It's so certainly sure. not bad. So that's the reason I took uh, telekinetic earlier, because going from a 17 to an 18 is nice. Going from an 18 to a 20 isn't as big of a deal. Yeah, so, I'm trying, I, yes. I'm just trying to think, uh, you know, there's the resilient wisdom. We want to, we, I feel like if we would have, uh, if we were going to get the hold person thing or the other you know thing that we need the wisdom save against, that's probably going to happen earlier than now. Probably. Yeah. And like I said, if you're some DMS won't throw a bunch of wisdom saves at their players, right? They intentionally don't do that because they don't want to make the game unfun. Cause if you're stuck in a hold mm -hmm. person for three rounds, you're not playing D and D. Right. Um, it kind of sucks. That that's the way it's, that that's the way it plays out. So some DMs will kind of hold off on throwing wisdom saves at people because they don't want to ruin the game. They'll try and challenge you in other ways, which is great and that's fine. In fact, we excel at most of those other ways they try and challenge us. So we'd almost prefer that. But if you're finding that at level six, you're just getting hit by that old person constantly, and I'm just using old person as an example, mm -hmm. go ahead and take this earlier. It won't hurt you. You'll be fine. It will not hurt the build whatsoever. All right. Uh, so that's are we are we done? Is that uh upper level? Almost. Uh oh. We're we're right at the end here, and it's levels eighteen through twenty. We've got nine level spells. You don't yeah. need my help. It, it's it, it, you have wish. It, wish. It really you don't need my help anymore. We don't need to be casting armor of agonist with a ninth level slot. Don't do that. Okay, we've been very gung ho. I want to now. You can if you want to, but there are better uses for ninth level slots. Oh, sure. An eighth yeah. level slot, though, an eighth level slot is a great use of it because there's not that many great eighth level spells, as you have learned in your spell ranking videos recently. Eighth level kind of sucks. Yeah, it does. That's a... yeah, crazy. It's weird. Uh, but an eighth level armor of Agathis, it's a difference of five temporary hit points and five damage compared to a ninth level 
So it's really not that big of a deal. No. So, but yeah, level 18 through uh, 20, just cast Meteor Swarm. <laughs> It'll fix whatever problem you have. So, uh, and I will say, uh, we do get a feat selection at the very last level, level 20. This oh, is very flexible. You do whatever you want with it. I'm going to make an honorable mention here because this might be needed for you earlier in the campaign, actually. And that's Metamagic Adept. Mm -hmm. This gives More us two Metamagics and two sorcery points to use as Metamagics with. We really only care about one of them, and that's Transmute Spell. Cold damage, as a rule, oh, right. is pretty good in 5e. It's not resisted by a ton of things, but if you're playing in something like Rime of the Frost Maiden, which is a campaign set in the frigid tundra, sure, you're not gonna. The cold damage isn't gonna help you much at all. It's gonna be resisted or immune. So. Transmute spell allows us to change our icy armor to something like fiery armor. Now, I will tell you the best damage type, generally speaking, is acid. Really? Acid is acid is resisted and resisted by the least number of creatures as a general rule compared to fire, poison, cold, lightning, or thunder. Mm -hmm. Right? Actually. I don't know if Thunder is viable for... I don't think Thunder is viable for... Transmute. Metamagic edit. Yeah. Transmute spell. I, it might be, in which case, Acid or Thunder. Thunder is also great. So, either of those, if you find that you're in a campaign where you're running into a lot of cold resistance, or even if your DM thinks you're getting a little too strong and <laughs> throws a bunch of cold resistant monsters at you, well, I mean, now we're just in an arms race. <laughs> so we take Metamagic Adept, switch it to Acid Armor, and now, oh, well, that Yeti doesn't have resistance to that now, does it? Now, if we are, like, yeah, all right, if the DM's intentionally throwing stuff at us that resists cold, that's one thing. But if we're going into Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, how soon are we taking this? Probably at level four. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I would even you, you're mentioning even say it here maybe after at level builds. nineteen and twenty, but that's not when you want to take this. Depending on no, it's it's campaign. really more of an honorable mention. Um, okay, and I will yeah. say though, I will say though, if you get to level twenty, this is still actually a pretty good pickup because at high levels, cold resistance is very common by creatures mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily expect. It. All devils and demons have cold resistance. Almost all. I'm sure there's a couple ex uh, exceptions. But most of them have cold resistance. And you're going to be fighting a lot of those at high levels, probably. Um, and there are a number of other examples as well. But if you're at level 20 and you're looking for a feat and you're about to go fight Asmodeus or something, he's probably not resistant to acid damage. Or thunder, if that's if that is viable for Metamagic Event. All right. Good to know. So that's it, huh? That's the build. It is a very viable character, I believe, from levels 1 to 20. We really do come online with Armor of Agathus as soon as we can start casting it. I'd say at second level. So that is character level 3 for us. Um, at levels 1 and 2, we still have a good AC and a good spellcasting modifier, so we're going to be fine. We'll survive those early levels. But once we can cast Armor of Agathus at a second level, I really think that's when the build comes on. And it only gets better with every single level. Our ward has more HP every time we level up. Our Armor of Agathus has more HP every time we gain a new spell level. This is a character that has marked growth and improvement every single time they leveled up. Yeah, there are no dead levels. Like a lot of fun to fun to use all the way through. Yeah, it's it's great. There are no dead levels. There are no times in the campaign where you level up and feel like I didn't really get too much there. Mm -hmm. You always get a lot every time. All right.
well, uh, I guess that's that. Um, was I felt like there was something else I wanted to say about it, but uh, now I've forgotten. All right, I guess we'll just call it there. That was uh, what did you call this one? The prickly old man. The prickly old man. This <laughs> I will say uh, as a last parting note: the role play on this character is wonderful. You are a person who can take a bunch of damage and dish it back out. The trash talk that you can give from this just writes itself. I love that it's a wizard that is, uh, you know, inviting damage, inviting themselves to be beat on. I would love to come on your channel at one point and talk about the squishy wizard fallacy in D&D and how wizards are actually the tankiest of all the classes. All right, we'll we'll save that for another one. (laughs) Stay tuned, viewers. But yes, you can be an old man, really frail, really weak looking, big long gray beard, pointy wizard hat. You can even disguise self to change what what it looks like you're wearing to just very thin wizard robes to make yourself look like such an appetizing target. Yeah. And then just be a nuisance. It's wonderful. (laughs) All right. Well, that was the prickly old man, Armor of Agathis build. Thank you, Cameron, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, Let us know what you think in the comments, and I hope to have you back sometime. uh, Talk about another build or talk about a fallacy or whatever. (laughs) I would love to. I would love to. All right. Well, that's that. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. If you found this helpful, informative, or entertaining, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button below. You needn't smash it. A gentle tap will suffice. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel. And make sure you check out the links in the description, or you'll find my Caverns and Creatures series of comedy fantasy novels, Sam's full review of the spell, and other fun things.